Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Live. Let me try that again, just in case it didn't actually go. Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Live. My name's Matt Marash. Uh, this is part of the Matt Marash YouTube channel. Every quarter we go live, so you know, roughly every three months or so, uh, to give you updates on what's going on with the channel, to engage one-on-one, -on -one and reward folks that are tuning into the live to get their questions answered right away. And usually I try to, you know, fluff it up a little bit with some large format equipment. This time I set up the ULF camera because a lot of folks had some interesting questions about the 12 by 20 that's sitting up there. Uh, I also, I'm really trying to do a lot today. I even got the Calotype, Calotype setup going. So I've got a, a negative from the big camera I want to print as well. Let me check the chat and see who all is uh, hanging out with us today. Let's see. Oh, we have a lot of folks. All right. We've got Devin. We have Anthony. We have Max. Of course, we have Lore moderating. Hey, we've got our friends over, for, uh, over in Scotland from Photography Online. Thanks for stopping by. All right. My mom is here. Hi, mom. All right. We have Dong. Uh, let's see. Arpon. Big Tog, all right. Uh, oh, I almost missed Marco. Hey, Marco, I think you may, excuse me, I think you may have the first question of the day. Uh, any advice on getting consistent temperatures on very hot days? I'm, gonna cr I'm going crazy trying to achieve 20 Celsius. Uh, as if you can't tell, it is sweltering hot up here as well. There is this giant AC unit up there, but it's meant to do like the whole half of the building. So yeah, it's, it's tough to really get um, like good, clean, consistent temperatures. My best recommendation is bring a small little lunchbox cooler, you know, like a full size cooler and bring some ice cubes in there. I'll, I'll actually add ice cubes to trays. For one of the processes I'm gonna be doing today, which is alternative photographic process, the temperature isn't as crucial, but the little bit of humidity we have is working well to its advantage. So unfortunately, I don't have a great recommendation. I know some folks that have water um, pH consistency issues, so too alkaline or too acidic, they'll actually get a water purifying unit. So when I first moved in here at, uh, oh, by the way, this is my darkroom space at uh, 400 West Rich in Columbus, Ohio. When I first moved in here, there was a uh, like this giant Culligan uh, machine and it actually cooled the water as well as kept it relatively neutral. That stuff usually has a slightly higher pH to it. Uh, let's see, let's check out. Oh my gosh, we've already got 35 folks. Thank you so much for stopping by and welcome to Large Format Live. Um, I, I'm using a shallow depth of field, so hopefully I'm not like too crazy <laughs> out of focus here. All right, let's see who else. Uh, let's see who else uh, is hanging out here in chat today. Uh, we've got Dillinger. Hey, Dillinger. Uh, we have Gene. We have Jay. Matthews. Is that Matthews? Lenick. Oh, great seeing you. All right. We have Andy, Jimmy, Brandon, Lucas, Bruno, and Marco. Hey, we've got Johnny Brown. Thanks for stopping by. Ooh, California. I, well, I just imagine everywhere it feels like the surface of the sun right now. Is there anybody that's watching where it's snowing? Because I want to be where you are right now. <laughs> it is very, very hot. I think even with the AC, it's like 80, mid 80s right now. Ooh. And in the dark, dark room, it gets, it gets pretty rough. All right, let's see. We're up to 45. Let's see if we can keep those numbers going. All right. All right, Mac, Max actually has a, a really good tip for working with film uh, in these crazy hot conditions. Uh, Trick I read somewhere is to fill film canisters with water, freeze it, and just yeet that into the developer. Uh, uh, bonus points for using the, the word yeet. Awesome. We've got Matthias, John, oh, Karin, hey, nice to see you. Uh, we have Tyler, Olas. Hey, Shane, thanks for stopping by. Oh, and there's Eric, hey, Eric. Hey, by the way, um, if you haven't uh, gone ahead and followed him yet, we have some. We have a couple of really nice channels that are already communicating back and forth in the chat. One of them, if you want to learn kind of the full, like the full span of anything digital photography, but they're also starting to get a little bit more into film. Check out Photography Online. They have great tutorials, and this is a shameless plug because they had me on their live stream uh, back a few months ago. So they're really great folks. And they have just a really cool team that, you know, offers some diverse opinions for stills and video and a little bit of film. 
We also have in the chat Mr. Shane Dignam. And Shane, I've known on and off for a few years because of like the for, uh, large format forums and Facebook groups. And he started his own channel and definitely has some really great stuff. Lots of field work, lots of really clean 8x10 color. All right, we've got GP. All right, we've got Dwarven Chef. Let's see. Oh, we've got Carrie over in the UK. Hey, Carrie. Please stay cool out there. Oh my goodness. I, I'm not hearing a lot of great stuff coming from Europe right now. It is hot, hot, hot. All right. Hey, we've got Danny. Hey, it was great seeing you at Photostock, Danny. All right. Ikaba. Great. Oh, here we go. We've got another question hanging out here in the chat. This is also, if this is your first time uh, hanging out at a live stream for the Large Format Friday show, what I usually do is hang out for the first 10 minutes or so. We get to know each other, answer some questions, and then I just try to get into like the main program. That's kind of how the layout's gonna go. It's pretty loose. I'm gonna try to keep this to about 90 minutes so I don't like completely keel over and Lore managing the chat doesn't keel over either. So um, let's see. Jimmy says, about to jump into 4x5 with the Intrepid. Any recommendations for cameras that might be a good alternative around the same price? Mainly shooting landscape, architecture, and looking to get a 90 and a 180 millimeter. Well, first of all, Jimmy, those are that's a great two lens setup. You got pretty wide and you have pretty like decent longer standard lens on there. If you're looking to spend new on an Intrepid, there's really not a lot of great options that you're going to find used in that price point. A few years ago, I would have recommended a Wista or Tachihara camera, like the wooden field camera I use for my field work episodes, but anymore, those have gone up considerably in price, probably about six to $700 US uh, and a little bit more even uh, international. So the Intrepid 4x5s are one of like the better kind of looking options. I know Ghibellini makes a, well, <laughs> I guess it's not that affordable. It's, it's still more than Intrepid. Hmm. Who does make something that's around Intrepid's price? You may be looking, you know, if you don't need to have all the movements of like a field camera, you could go with something like a Graflex, like a Crown Graphic or a Speed Graphic. You get a really nice Graflex for that. You may be a little more limited in terms of bellows, uh, bellows span as far like both wide and, uh, and long, but that's a pretty good option too. Hey, I've got Sam. How's it going, Sam? All right, Florian's here. We've got Austin, Eric. Devin, all right. Let's see, who else? We, um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, Austin has uh, a little comment about, oh, about Graflex versus Intrepid. Uh, same lenses and everything, but the pictures are not as sharp for some reason. What could be the difference? You know, uh, one thing I have seen with some of the Intrepid cameras, and I think this is just uh, the cost of using uh, the woods and the 3D printed components that they do, is you really have to make sure everything is locked down really nice and tight. Uh, if you want some ticks and uh, ticks, <laughs> if you want ticks, go out and dust tall grass. No, if you want some tips and tricks on working with Intrepids, especially you know leveling them out, making sure you get rid of all that shake and handling them in windy conditions because they are so light, um, I recommend checking out some of Ben Horn's videos. If you haven't checked out Ben's Horn, uh, Ben Horn's channel, it's awesome. He has like definitely got the full on Bob Ross chill field work vibes. It's, it's everything I could wish to do with field work and more. So uh, I recommend checking out his stuff on there, but really Intrepid is such a light camera. There's a point at which something becomes so heavy you don't want to take it out, but then something that's almost so light that it, it introduces its own unique problems. Ask any person that does a lot of video what I'm talking about. When you're shooting video, if you work with a camera that's too light, it'll actually show the shake a lot more than if you work with a heavier camera. That's actually why the camera I'm filming this with right now has a cage and a handle and all this other crap kind of built around it. It actually makes it heavier, so when I try to stabilize it without using software and stuff, it looks a lot better. All right, let me catch up on, uh, on oh my gosh, we're at 77 folks. Hey, thanks everybody for stopping by. Uh, this is going great so far. I'm really happy to see everybody in, uh, in good spirits today. Uh, we've, got, we've got Roger, we have Dave. Let's see, we have Jack. Oh, Jack, thank you for reminding us. Uh, so Chroma camera is a great option um, for really, really lightweight and well-built. Uh, we have Oscar, awesome cameras. Hey, how's it going, awesome cameras? We have Dave. We have Philip, Roger, and a life in words and pictures. Hey, all right, how's it going, everybody? Um, so we've been, 
We've been going for a few minutes now. Yeah, about the first 10 minutes. We're at 80 folks now. If this is your first time stopping by, welcome to Large Format Live. It is a Large Format Friday as well. I'm coming to you here live from my darkroom space here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, welcome to the Matt Marash channel. If you have any questions about the large format, uh, large format photographic process, you can always feel free to uh, throw your name in the comments. Uh, ask any question you want. I'll try to get to them as I can. Main programming for today. Really, I've been running up against it. I have a few large uh, workshops and some freelance gigs coming up and I really didn't have, have the time to assemble uh, the videos I wanted to put out. And instead of putting out like a subpar thing, it's been a while since I've gone live. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, it's kind of a weird uh, use of technology that it's sometimes easier to go live than it is to make like this pre-produced thing. But that's where we're at here in 2022. So today I'm going to update you guys on kind of some additions and things I, I'm going to be adding to the channel very, very slowly kind of trickling in. We're going to do some printing because I have my alternative photographic process set up. My UV source is right down here uh, beneath me. And in the darkroom space, I have another camera here. Let me switch it over. I have another camera trained on uh, the darkroom sink so I can hand coat a print and get to reveal that to everybody live. Now the headline of this also read, giveaway, I've got a goal and it is a selfish goal. If we can hit 120 folks watching the live stream, we're already two thirds of the way there. So if we can hit 120 concurrent viewers, so that's 120 folks watching for at least a few minutes, we're going to do a giveaway. Now it's not a huge giveaway because I just gave away and shipped, uh, uh, shipped that Graflex crown graphic kit, but I'm going to give away this, this awesome little camera that it has way more power than I ever thought it could. And this is the paint cam camera. This was made by a funky uh, camera manufacturer. His name is Bob Gratian. And he made this, uh, all these wild homemade cameras. This one is interesting because there are three pinhole lenses on this paint can, or is it four? I'm sorry, yeah, there's three pin, uh, pinhole lenses on the side of the can, and there's an anamorphic pinhole on the top of it. It's a wild little thing. I just don't use it as much as it probably needs to be used. So I'm going to give it to uh, a lucky, a lucky viewer. So if you are here today and we hit that 120 concurrence, I'm going to give this camera away. All right, let's check and see how the questions are doing right now. All right. Well, we have somebody viewing from Korea. Hey, thanks for stopping by. All right. Folks from Ireland. Oh, okay. Well, a life and uh, life and words and picture says, I would love to see Matt build a four x five camera. I don't think you'd like to see me build a four x five camera. I might be better off building something with popsicle sticks than actually trying to engineer a camera. I am going to leave that to the true craftsman. I do have some power tools and things to finish wood projects, but I really haven't done much more than like a raised bed and a spice rack and some repairs. I am not that handy yet. Maybe one of these days, but for now, I'm going to leave it to the folks like Mr. Keith Canham, who made this glorious piece of machinery back here. That's by the way, the Canham 12 by 20 camera. All right, we're at 90 folks. We're, uh, we're humming along. So we're only 30 away from the camera giveaway. No, no, uh, you're not, you don't have to be a subscriber of the channel to receive this. Um, there are a few select countries that I can't ship to, unfortunately, because of the U.S. Postal Service. If you want to find out details for that, you can head over to my website, mirage.com giveaways. That's where I always host the full LFF giveaways. But I wanted to do something special because it's Large Format Friday and I want to try to like, get folks engaged with this stuff. All right, let's see. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Dwarven Chef asks, I inherited a Linhoff Technica 4x5 with a 135 Rodenstock. Nice. All right. It's insanely wide for what I'm used to. What would be a better lens uh, to a normal uh, or for normal to macro lens? You know, almost any lens, if you have a long enough bellows, can go into like the macro range. But one thing you have to like be aware of when using something like a Linhoff you're going to be bellows limited. Now I know some Linhoffs in the back, you can get that little extra bit of extension on those four metal rods. That's also how you do your rear standard movements. I think you may be able to get away with a one, probably like a 180 or a 210 macro because by the time, no, I don't even know if you could do a 210. 
I, yeah, I would have to have somebody in the chat look that up. I think 180 might be, might be it because by the time you're doing like a full one-to-one -one macro, meaning something is reproduced life-size, you are actually using twice the focal length in bellows. That means you would need 360 millimeters of bellows to achieve macro. More standard, well, not standard, but more common 4x5 macro lenses are like 120s, 135s, 150s. Um, but 180, I think, is like the next step that has several macro options available. Uh, usually, you're using a shorter focal length than you would uh, want for like standard shooting, but you're you know indefinitely getting like closer to that macro subject. Now, if you don't need to go true one to one, I would recommend looking in that 180 to 210 range just to give you that little bit of reach. But you're not going to get you know the full one to one. All right. Uh oh, I knew somebody was going to ask. I thought about taking it out of the freezer because. Uh, Jason, Mr. Grainy Days, spilled the beans yesterday on the Aerochrome 4x5. Yes, it is true. I've got 10 sheets of Aerochrome, and I am terrified to use it. I already have a bunch of 8x10 Aerochrome and, or not Aerochrome, sorry, uh, 8x10 infrared, black and white. And the thought of doing color infrared, oh, like I'm getting, like my heart rate is getting up there just thinking about it. It's terrifying. Uh, to consider. Oh my gosh, hold on. Uh, there's some folks that just uh, just kicked into the channel. Thank you so much. Let me get to uh, who uh, who did that. Let's see. Um, Gordon, thanks so much for uh, for the six bucks. I really really appreciate it. Hey Brian, thanks for chipping. I didn't see that. why didn't why didn't Brian's contribution show up on there? Anyway, Brian Burks, thank you so much. Another great channel. If you're not watching and subscribing to Brian's awesome work, go over to Brian Burke's channel right now. Hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe. He's an awesome, awesome dude. All right. Oh my goodness. So many cool folks. All right. So on top of Gordon, who else did? Oh, KZ. Hey, uh, he says, thank you, Matt, for all the work you do for the community. Dude, thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate uh, these donations. Uh, it's, it's this, I try to run this whole thing like PBS style. Like I don't try to like wall off or, you know, put a paywall in front of the stuff I know. It's hard enough to get folks together, you know, in person, not just behind a screen, uh, to shoot this stuff and talk about it. So I just want to connect as many people as possible and get folks into this because, yes, selfishly, I want to see this continue as long as it can. Honestly, I've been doing film photography longer than I thought it would be possible because right around the time I got started was when Kodak filed for bankruptcy. Polaroid was kind of done before it became impossible and became Polaroid again. I just didn't think there was that much going. And then I started to learn more about what keeps photography going and who is keeping it going. A lot of it is the movie industry and they're still really jazzed about film. And now we have another generation, you know, the younger millennials, Gen Z folks, and even some Gen Alpha folks because of the millennials having kids are getting into film and they're getting into it for different reasons, which is great. I just love seeing it. All right, let's see who we've got here. Oh my gosh, all right, I gotta get some questions. Devin, oh my gosh, what are you guys doing? Devin, thank you so much. All right. Oh, uh, Dong uh, answered in the chat. 300 mil is the max bellows draw for a Linhoff. So at, uh, at the closest, you could go to a 150 millimeter macro, but yeah, that's gonna be pretty tough. All right. Very cool, let's see. Gordon says, I want to see Matt shoot and print a panorama manually uh, with his 4x5 camera. Ooh, that would be, I, you know what, that's not, that's not impossible. I could, I do have access to a 4x5 5x7 enlarger, so I'm not going to say it's, yeah, it's possible. There's so much I need to do yet. And actually, speaking of which, I've been streaming for long enough that I, ha I haven't even got to like the main, main deal. I do want to update some folks on the channel. By the way, if this is your first time stopping by, Hi there, my name is Matt Marash. Welcome to Large Format Live. Uh, every other Friday, we're gonna be here talking about something large format, typically in a pre-recorded sense, but every quarter or so, so every three months, we're here and we're streaming, connecting with folks completely worldwide. This is so neat. I, I think we have at least 10 countries that are watching right now. That is just so cool to me that we have the tech to do that. Uh, so what I wanted to update some folks about today you know, I backed off from doing the weekly videos. That was one so I could have more time to like do the actual photography thing, go out, shoot. Uh, I still don't have like a, a unifying project other than the channel. So I've really been trying to step back and kind of get back to get back to my roots. I know that's like a cliche thing at this point, but really get back to why it is 
I wanted to get into photography, what I want to share and do with, with my actual photography, not just talking about it and stuff. And uh, actually, I, I was thinking about this earlier because I saw Mr. Brian Burks uh, make a tweet uh, related similarly to like, enough of us aren't talking about the why. And yeah, it got me thinking like, what, what other projects do I want to do? What, you know, it's, it's always, of course, it's fun to have the big stuff and all this, all this yada yada, but like, what am I doing with it? Why am I doing that thing? How can I use it as a tool? Kind of like I'm using these digital cameras to connect with everybody. So uh, it's, it's always good stuff to think about. And um, yeah, so, you know, more food for thought. I'll also follow Brian on Twitter. He's, he's got a lot of good stuff on there. All right. Oh my gosh, all right, we're at 99. We are almost at 100. That means we're 21 folks away from this ridiculous pinhole giveaway. It is kind of a ridiculous camera, but it's really, really fun. I had zero expectations when I tried this out. Uh, the anamorphic was still super funky. Um, so like anamorphic, it's actually the lights coming in from the top, but it, it spreads along paper or film on the inside. It's pretty wild. And this is a worldwide competition, or not competition, just worldwide giveaway. Uh, some countries apply. Uh, I'll, I'll do some research on that, you know, on the back end. So if you're not eligible, we'll, we'll get you something. All right. Hey, oh my gosh, we, we just hit 100. My goodness. All right. I'm trying to keep up with these questions. This is awesome. Um, bu, bu, bu. Okay, Alan Browning asks, Hi Matt, uh, might black and white transparency film and or reversal process be something you plan to review in the future? Um, yes. The, the short answer is very much yes. I actually have two videos that I have scripts for that I'm working, uh, working towards with black and white transparency, uh, but I'll give you the cliff notes here. Black and white transparency or slide or reversal is just used with select black and white films. Now the OG, not the OG, like one of the best processes that's out there is the DR5 Chrome process, which was a proprietary mixture of you know processing steps to give you brilliant results with a very large gamut of black and white films but there are some folks out there that are recreating their own unique reversal processes there are even reversal process kits available from some european manufacturers uh, like adox that has a really great you know less harmful reversal kit i'm going to be using the method uh, from mr alvandi um, he's got a wealth of resources on his website but so if you look up mr alvandi a l v a n DI. He's got some awesome stuff. All right, we've got Alan from Northern Ireland. Hey, Alan. All right. Calvin, thanks for stopping by. Let's see. Oh my gosh, it just refreshed again. Oh no. Oh no, I'm really, I'm really falling behind. Guys, thank you so much uh, for hanging in there. Uh, oh no, we dipped, uh, we dipped some viewers, but uh, well, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. Da, 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 da. Uh, someone wants to talk 1417. Okay, I'm going to table that for a sec. All right. Oh, Eric brings up, has anybody watched uh, the recent Smarter Every Day video? Uh, Smarter Every Day is this ginormous YouTube channel, and I think he's got a little bit of the film bug. Definitely that engineering side coming through, but he toured the Kodak facility. I haven't seen it yet. I've seen a whole bunch of people buzzing about it, and it's in my to-watch list, but uh, if, it's from, if it's from Smarter Every Day, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a deep dive, and I'm going to learn things that I haven't, you know, after 12 years doing it and reading books and such. So uh, it's going to be great. Let's see. Yes, Lore, I am giving away the paint can. I am not ashamed of it. Um, I think it is a, a, great, a great little camera. And you know, who's gonna steal it? They're gonna think it's like an empty paint can. <laughs> All right, Gordon, thank you so much for the five. I really, really appreciate it. Um, oh, wait, how about some love for prints rather than screen images? Does anyone do print? You know what? Print exchanges are tough. They are very, very tough to accomplish. I've participated in several, and I would say there's about a third of them just like, they fall apart at the seams. And the reason they do is organizing all the different mailing addresses and the longer, so if you wanna get a lot of people in on a print exchange, you have to open that window. But the longer that window stays open, the more these weird exceptions happen. And I've even ha had it happen to myself where I was part of an exchange and then like, I had to drop out for like a family emergency that happened. So they're, they're tough. 
the best print exchanges I found were where you attend like shorter workshop type events like Photostock. If you wanna learn more about Photostock, just check out the previous LFF episode on gatekeeping. I do have uh, a little bit in there to break up the, the kind of the, the debate on gatekeeping. I talk about uh, Photostock 2022. Uh, there's a yearly print exchange there and it, there's just lots of great energy when that happens. All right. Goodness. Robert, thanks for stopping by. All right. You know what? Max has a great question. And actually, I'm going to tie this into the comment about um, 14 by 17. My favorite thing about 12 by 20 is it's 12 by 20. If you want to make a big old contact print, it's pretty easy to do. In fact, I need to get into the darkroom and start coding because, oh my God, I didn't even coat the big... Uh, big batch yet. So I'm going to switch the camera over. I'm going to try to table as many uh, questions uh, until we get in there because I'm not going to be able to see chat stuff. So I'm going to get, we're going to head into the dark room. I'm going to talk about the alternative print that I'm coding and I'll talk about some things I like with 12 by 20 and try to try to get some more questions going here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Very cool. Oh, uh, real quick. Orlando asked, do I have any large format merch? I do have a spring slash Teespring store. I don't really talk that much about it. I do have a link in some of my videos, uh, but uh, Orlando, if you send me an email, so uh, I'm going to type in the chat, uh, large format questions at gmail.com. Uh, sh shoot me a message. Um, I'll send you the link to all that stuff. I have this, uh, this is uh, FPP or Film Photography Podcast merch, uh, but I also have my own merch that has like the Get a Freaking Tripod uh, t-shirt, which it, it's kind of fun. All right. Very cool. All right, I'm going to head into the dark room uh, and we're going to get coding. So kind of give you the lowdown of what's going on here. So I've got a camera top down. And uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to prepare a solution for coding a calotype or calotype print. Gosh, I'm still really bad at pronouncing, uh, pronouncing it the right way. And I lost my gloves. Where'd my gloves go? There's my gloves. All right, hang in there with me, folks. If you're just stopping by and you're like, what the heck is this? This is large format live, a portion of large format Friday that happens every quarter where we go live from the darkroom space. You know what, actually, while I'm getting my gloves on, I wanna show you guys some stuff real quick because that might look even cooler. So what I'm about to do, I made, I made a few more 12 by 20 negatives um, since the recent episode on introducing my 12 by 20 camera and I'm gonna make a print from this because this is a giant ultra large format negative, I'm able to make what's called a contact print. A contact print is where you lay the negative in firm contact with a, an emulsion, a light sensitive, a light sensitive coating on some paper. And you're actually creating the print directly from there. It's extra sharp because there's no enlargement needed and it looks gorgeous. I'm going to be printing on this I'm going to be printing on this awesome paper stock. This is called Hanamula Platinum Rag. Uh, Hanamula is one of the older paper mills from Germany. They're over 400 years old, which is just like wild to think about. I've torn off, you can see here, like a few test sheets with the deckled edges. I'm going to coat a big boy here, and I've already done some test strips, so there is some magic of television, but we're going to get in there, coat one of these at least, expose it, and develop it out, and I'm really excited to show you what that negative looks like. All right. Oh my gosh, we're actually at 115. Uh, Laura, please keep track for me. If we hit 120, we are going to give away the paint can camera at the end of the stream. You will have to be in the chat for that to happen. Yes, I know. That's like kind of a selfish thing, but that's I'm going to make you stay, uh, stay on standby to get the thing. All right. Where are my magnets? Do I have my magnets? Oh, I do. Okay. So there's my big piece of paper. You can see I've got a pretty wide lens, so my arms are going to look really, really big. They aren't really big. You know what? I don't know if that's going to work. Uh, let's get my metal sheet. Got a piece of, piece of galvanized there, and that piece of galvanized is going to hold my paper down. You can see this is like not 100% going to be the 
flattest thing. But I just need to have these magnets hold the paper down. I just need to get it flat. That's the only downside about buying paper on a roll is you have to flatten it somehow. Oh no, I have a crease. You know what, I, I'm gonna like, hmm, let me see if I have one that doesn't have a crease. Sometimes tearing off these big old sheets gives you a big wrinkly boy. Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna coat this other one. Oh goodness, all right. So what I'm doing now is I'm coating, uh, I'm in a dark room, so it doesn't have to be dark. As you can see, it's actually really bright. The only consideration you need to make when you're going to do this type of alternative process printing, you wanna preferably be near a water source, so somewhere where you can have running water. Optional, but it makes things really easy. So running water, a place you can get kind of messy, pour chemicals on and such, and then you want, um, yeah, then you want a place that's gonna keep out a lot of the daylight because daylight or the UV portion of daylight is gonna be what can cause um, exposure to this stuff. So I've got my little Pyrex shot glass here. If you wanna learn in kind of like a little more detail and learn as you go about this process, um, I'm gonna put a link in the final upload of this video to where I go through this uh, printing process. It's kind of a fun Bob Ross spoof, uh, spoof, <laughs> spoof video where I pretend like we're doing happy little trees. So uh, kale type is a two part alternative photographic process. I have a part A and a part B. Part A is ferric oxalate and part B is silver nitrate. Now I do have a little a little bit of daylight coming in, but I'm gonna try to coat this really fast and forget that it can harm my final print. I'm also gonna bring a negative over so I can get a preview of the size and coating area. How are we doing? Okay, we're at 111, we're hanging in there. We're not, not quite to 120, or if we hit 120, sorry, I missed it. Okay, so I'm kinda going between the magnets, leaving about an inch. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. So, mixing some sensitizer. Ferric oxalate. Gonna do 25 drops, yeah. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. I changed my mind halfway through. I'm gonna do 35 drops. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. This is probably overkill, but I honestly can't remember what I did uh, when I was doing cyanotype uh, tests of 1220. Uh, so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. If you're just tuning in, welcome to Large Format Live. My name is Matt Marash. We're in the dark room. You, all you see before you is this empty white canvas and this little, little shot glass worth of some, with some yellow greenish goop. This is my sensitizer. I'm gonna coat this big honkin' sheet of cotton rag stock paper. I'm gonna coat that with this sensitizer and hopefully you'll be able to see a print when we're done. I'm gonna use my big old brush here. This is, oh goodness, this is kind of a messy hockey brush, but I'm gonna dip it in some, actually, you know what, I'm gonna use my smaller brush. It's gonna take longer but this brush is nicer. This is my already wetted uh, two inch hockey brush, really fine hairs. Just get it, get it damp, but not like soaking. And you know what? I'm, I don't want this thing to fail on stream. I'm gonna do 40 drops because I'm getting like paranoid now. So I'm gonna do five more drops of part A, five more of B. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Cool. 
It's important to work in an environment where you don't have direct sunlight coming in. You can work under incandescent lights, but you can't work in anything brighter. Now, the curliness of this paper will go down as the paper gets wet and will start to uh, start to like weigh itself down and then dry in different areas. So hopefully you'll be able to see some coating action. I'm going to quickly wipe this along and then I'm going to start brushing. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, let's coat a cal uh, calotype. Okay, and we're off. Moving our sensitizer. It's okay that I'm not the full size of 12 by 20 yet. As I pull this stuff along, we're going to get there. Oh yeah. See how the paper's already kind of settling and relaxing a little bit? We're just pushing our puddles. It's easy to get the height of this because it's kind of short on the high end, but I need to make sure I get the length properly. So that's why I'm pulling it side to side a little bit more first. It's nice to make a circular motion with this and not the actual brush, but like a clockwise or counterclockwise motion. So I'm brushing back and forth. So now I'm gonna go to the right. One two, three, four, five. Okay, and now I'm gonna go up. Two, three, four. Okay, it's gonna take me a long time because I have a big old print and I have a small brush. As your print size gets bigger and you're, if you're trying to do hand coating, it's a good idea to get an appropriately sized brush. I'm a little worried I'm not gonna have enough stuff, enough emulsion to reach this whole negative, but such is life. Oh yeah, we're gonna have enough. Now, the humidity of the room is a little higher than it normally is, but it's also really, really hot right now. And this is causing the emulsion to dry a little bit faster. You can see the print's starting to get wavy too. That's because we have these weights that are causing uh, different kind of stress levels to the, uh, to the paper. These waves are okay. It will, it will not remain this wavy once it's dried and in contact. Oh yeah. Uh, it's not going to be like a complete 12 by 20, but if I recall, my negative has a little bit of image circle loss, so I'm not going to sweat it. All right, next time we're going to do 50 drops. Maybe I'll coat another one. No, 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 we'll just do the one today. I want to keep I want to keep today's stream manageable, and if I'm doing a giveaway and more questions, this will be good. All right, yeah, this is going to be like slightly under 12 by 20. But it's going to look good. It's going to look very painterly. All right. We're already starting to get dry. And with the magnets off, we have a piece of paper. Now I can't show this to you on the other camera because that would cause exposure. So right now it's gonna look like a pale yellow green. It's going to get darker and darker as we give it more exposure. But for now, we have to keep it in the dark and let it air dry. Normally I would put a fan on things, but I don't have that luxury right now. Whoa, do my eyes deceive me? I see 119 concurrence. I'm gonna check with Laura in the chat, but I think, I think we might have hit the giveaway target number. Let's take a look. Okay, oh, we did hit, we did hit 120, okay, cool. Perfect. Awesome. All right, let's see if I can catch up on some questions. Ocha Nomu, thank you for the $5 donation to the channel. I really, really appreciate it. It really helps with all the toys and the expensive chemicals and stuff, but it's, it's totally optional. Donations are greatly appreciated. In fact, I, I have uh, a select group of folks that have decided to give on a continuing basis to the channel. That's the LFF Sustaining Member Program. Thank you so much. It really helps keep things going and pay for websites. It's, you know, everything's expensive. And now everything's hot too, so I appreciate you. All right. Ah, Roger asks, Matt, how do you clean your brushes? I found I get gunk from last print and have, I have gone to the glass rod instead. Well, Roger, I will say going to the coating rod is probably a better idea anyway, because yeah, you're using less chemicals. You can be very exact. Uh, coating rods, which is a glass rod, uh, which pushes a puddle of chemicals, also known as a puddle pusher, is a great way to hand coat prints. It doesn't look as brushed or painterly, but you know, those brush strokes cost money, uh, like in the grand scheme of things. So it's a, it's a good idea to use that. Brushes really can't get completely cleaned. If you go from a distilled water soaked good brush 
right back to distilled water after your coating, it will minimize the soak up of those chemicals, but they're always gonna wick up into the brush. My best recommendation is keep your brushes separate. So if you use one brush, so I have the, the golden looking brush I have, I try to do just uh, the calotypes and platinum palladium with it. I have done cyanotype once or twice, and you can see that other big brush I have has uh, blue stains. The cyanotype just gets everywhere. Um, Any more for cyanotype, I'll use like the foam brushes, the really cheap ones, almost like they're disposable. But glass coating rods are great because the glass is not gonna pick up anything. You just soak it when you're done. All right. Uh, Gordon says, I see a UV light head in my future. Yeah, it's, it's an awesome thing to have. If you want to learn how to build the UV light that I'm going to be using here today, I have a link to, well, I'll have a link to a previous video. But if you just look up UV LED um, on the channel, so if you go to the Matt Marash, you know, click my icon, you go to the channel, type in UV LED. There's only one video that covers it, and it's, it's comprehensive. Uh, credits to... Uh, the credits don't go to me for the light. I did not create it. I'm not that handy. Uh, I just bought the stuff and pieced it together. Um, so thank you, Tim Layton, for creating the original blog post that I, I referenced multiple times in that video. All right. How are we doing? Perfect. Uh, Kahan or Kyan uh, says he should write a book about LFF. That would be... I could probably tell a decent story about that, or I guess like the whole film photography journey. I just, books are like my Achilles heel. Uh, this is why I've not released a book yet. Like I don't, I don't think in books. I'm trying to get there. I'm watching through a large backlog of Alex Soth videos, both his own and like old Aperture interviews, as well as watching him on TikTok. He's one of my favorite TikTok accounts to watch because he has really insightful stuff and then also really just random stuff. He kind of uses it the way, yeah, I kind of like to use TikTok. So really neat stuff on there. Let's see. Uh, Trucker, thanks for joining us from Rhode Island. Great. All right, let's see if I can get to, we'll get to a few questions. Uh, I'm going to go through the question log and then you know what? Yeah, um, we'll probably have a few more. I, I'm probably not going to want to do the actual print exposure and final reveal of the print until close to the end of stream. So maybe we'll do the giveaway like a little bit before then, but it's definitely happening now. I see those concurrent numbers. They are up. They are steady. Thank you so much for stopping by. Again, this is Large Format Live. My name is Matt Marash. We've got folks from all around the world tuning in, talking about, asking questions about Large format photography. Right now I've got these gloves on because I'm in the process of making an alternative photographic process print. An alternative photographic process is one where you're not using silver gelatin papers and you can, for the most part, work in the daylight. The only exposure unit you need is the sun. There's plenty of sun coming in through the window today. Or if you want something more controlled and consistent, you live in a gloomier environment, you can also build a UV LED light source. So there's lots of options out there for this large format stuff. That's what I love about it. Um, earlier, there was a question about uh, 12 by 20, which is this, that's what this giant thing is back here. It's, um, why do I like 12 by 20? I like it for the contact print size, being able to just lay, at, lay the negative on a big sheet of paper and you get a big old print. Now, the problem with that, of course, is cost. There's nothing cheap about that. It's a luxury in every sense of the word. And I've just dreamt of one forever. So that's why I like it. Now there is another format that's very similar to this one in terms of like size and scale. And that's 14 by 17. I don't know too much about 14 by 17, but I do know somebody that does. One of the folks I learned platinum palladium print processing from, or platinum palladium printing from, was Mr. Scott Davis, also known as DC Photo Artist. He gave me a great tutorial over the course of a few days on working in the platinum, the new sodium platinum process. And he showed me all of his classic Canham large and ultra large format cameras. He's a big 14 by 17 shooter and it's a really great format for portrait. It feels somewhere between an RZ and a Hasselblad, but enormous. And the size of the print is gorgeous, fits beautifully in a 20 by 24 frame. And it's just, when you get a big old print, it's, it's an experience. It's something to look back and behold. But the nice thing about ultra large format, you can get right up to it and it's, you're not gonna see any grain, just lovely, lovely detail. It's a contact print. All right. Let's see, 
who all who all is still here uh-huh let's see oh hey we've got nico in the chat hey nico thanks for stopping by um orlando from dallas Let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, Tyler asks, do you guys store film sheets in holders in the fridge or freezer or remove them and put them in a spare light tight box? Uh, that's a great topic for discussion, Tyler. I am a big fan of not putting film holders in like a different environment. And I learned this lesson um, not with the fridge, but more or less with taking a film holder out of your bag and putting it into the camera that slight little pocket of air that sits between the dark slide of actually what am i doing i have a i have a dark slide in here i'll be right back <laughs> all right here we go well i hope there's not film in here i don't think there is Okay, now I'm really, really not sure. Well, we've got 131 folks watching. Thank you so much for stopping by. This is a film holder for my Canham 12x20. It's enormous. It, this is an AWB film holder. Um, it does a great job. So when you pull the dark slide, you're gonna reveal the film. <gasps> okay, no, there's no film in there. It's all good. Um, there's this little flap. That's where you load your giant sheet O film in there. and. You can see there's a teeny tiny gap. This is what's, um, that gap is usually measured from the top of the slide to the back. This is known as your T distance. Uh, but that little gap, it creates a pocket of air. And that pocket of air can cause a temperature, and pressure, and humidity differential. When what was in your bag or that layer of air that was trapped between this, usually a plastic dark slide or metal, and the rest of the world, if there's a large differential, your film can actually pop. Like you'll hear like a, it sounds like a wobbly metal kind of pop sound. And when it does that, it can actually fall out of the film holder and into the bellows of the camera. When that happens, it's gut wrenching. And you have a decision to make. Do you open up the back of the camera and ruin the sheet of film? Or do you stop everything you're doing, make it light tight and go back to the darkroom? All of this to say, I don't store film in a fridge once it's in here, but I'll do my best to keep it dark, cool, and relatively dry. So usually I'll put film holders in my basement or somewhere that's um, at, at ground level or underground level um, so it has a relatively low temperature. That's a great way to store them. And I find uh, heat isn't that terrible to film unless it's extreme heat over a prolonged period of time. All right. Thanks for that question, Tyler. That was a really, really good one. Um, I can see my print is drying nicely. I don't see any weird greening on it, so I think it looks good. All right, let's jump back in front of the camera so people know that I'm still here. Hey there, thanks for stopping by. We're, uh, this is Large Format Live. Um, we're in the middle of making prints. We got 125 folks watching, which means if you're, stay, you're staying tuned, we're gonna be giving away this camera here in a little bit. You know what, uh, once we hit the hour mark, so you've still got, uh, if you're still gonna tweet to friends or get, you know, get folks to join in on this, uh, you have to be present in the chat for the giveaway. But we're giving away this very one of a kind pinhole paint can. If you want to see results with that, if you type paint can onto uh, my channel, you'll see I did a whole large format Friday episode where I shot that pinhole camera with some paper and the results were better than some other pinholes I've used. All right, whew. You know what, I have water. I should get some water. How are we doing? All right. Oscar, this is a very, very good question. Oscar, a Oscar asks, where do I dispose of chemicals? A lot of times uh, the developer that you're using is so easily neutralized or killed with tap water. A lot of times you can flush that unless it contains really, really nasty stuff, in which case you can collect your uh, depleted developer, fixer, and other chemicals. Uh, you can get rid of those at your local uh, waste management facility. In Columbus, Ohio, that's a place known as SWACO. What is it? Is it? Oh, Solid Waste Authority of Columbus, Ohio. So if you go to SWACO 
I think it's Swaco.com or .org. Uh, they have all, all the sort of details about getting rid of that. The truth is a lot of the chemicals that we use for film photography are far less aggressive than what a lot of folks use daily to clean their toilets, their sinks, and silverware. So it's, in the grand scheme of things, it's not really bad, but if all of us are using it and we're doing a lot of this stuff, yeah, it, you know, you wanna manage your own impact. There's also a lot of, a lot of boutique manufacturers of film chemicals that are making eco versions of those chemicals. Um, one of them, if you go onto ADOX's website, they have a lot of eco-friendly chemicals. Um, Maco Direct, one of the ADOX distributors in Europe, they have a lot of eco-friendly stuff. Sprint has some eco-friendly stuff. So there are folks out there that are making things a little bit more environmentally conscious, but the nastiest stuff overall is gonna be Fixer. And that can be reused and reused, and you can also use what's called electroplating um, to capture some of that silver. You can also use steel wool to do that. You know what, this brings up a really good topic. There are a decent number of channels out there that go into some specifics on darkroom chemicals, but I mentioned in the title of this that I was gonna have some channel additions or announcements. One of the things I'm gonna, you're gonna start seeing from the channel, it's, the channel isn't called Large Format Friday. Large Format Friday is just a, a show that shows up on the Matt Mirage channel. It's the one I've been focusing on because I wanted to build an audience and really see if folks were interested in this. Um, other shows that you're gonna see from me on the channel on occasion, you're gonna see a series called DIY Darkroom. DIY Darkroom are gonna be usually short form videos, no longer than seven to 10 minutes, where we go deeper into specific topics about doing it yourself in the darkroom. So how to set up a darkroom, how to manage mixing chemicals, how to mix certain components, how to handle those, how to treat those. That is gonna be a series that you're gonna see not on large format Fridays, that's, that's Friday is sacred for LFF, but there are gonna be other days and other times of the month where you're gonna see different shows. I don't know if they're gonna be weekly or monthly or what, or what have you, but I'm gonna be adding those slowly, really just to keep it sustainable, but to put more information out there in a place that you're already present. I, the one promise I'll make to you is, Everything that shows up on the Matt Mirage channel is gonna be dedicated to something in film photography. So there's always gonna be a tie-in. If I'm talking about something digital, it's a digital way to apply film photography because I wanna give back as much as I've learned and am currently learning about film. You never really stop. That's the cool thing about photography. All right, whew, I've been talking. We've got a few more minutes before the giveaway. I wanna thank everybody for stopping by. Welcome to Large Format Friday, all of that good stuff. Um, did I see stuff in the chat? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, Gordon brought up a really interesting point. When you are making, uh, exposing and developing negatives, so the black and white negative typically, for the alternative photographic processes, that negative has to have a lot more density. In fact, I think, yeah, I'm gonna see if I can light up one of my light boxes over here to illustrate my point a little bit more. Let's see, where's my, do I have one that's close to the outlet? Oh, I do, uh-oh. My other power strip is going away. All right, let's see. I don't know which light box this is and if it'll even be worth it, but let's see. Is it this one? Ah, it's this one all the way back here. Can you guys see this one? Nah, it's not really doing anything. Ah, never mind. When you make a negative for an alternative photographic process, that negative is gonna need to have more density and more contrast. Density is the ability to see or not to see through the negative. I develop my negatives out in a specialty black and white developer that stains the negative. It's called Pyrocat HD. We're gonna have a DIY darkroom all about Pyrocat HD. But the parts where you can hardly see through it, these are the higher density portions. The area that looks almost transparent, this is what's known as the film base. And the difference between this film base and how thick this darker area is over here, that's gonna give you your contrast or your contrast index. Now you can go really deep into the weeds and stuff and you know calculate, oh, do I have the dynamic range and the right developer to make this happen? But overall, you're gonna to wanna to add adequate exposure and give it a slightly more aggressive development. This is another great use for increasing temperatures. Uh, I like to use increased ambient temperatures to use the same developing concentration and give myself the same time just at a higher temperature to give me a little bit more contrast in my negative. I really gotta find the negative protector for that. It's kind of scaring me. 
By the way, that film I'm making the print on today was exposed with Ilford HP 5 Plus. It's not quite fresh, but it's fresh enough for what I'm doing. All right, whew, I need, I need more water. Uh, let's see. Let's see, how are questions coming? Uh, hey, Renee, thanks for stopping by, man. It was great seeing you at, uh, at Photostock. Case Meyer, thanks for stopping by. Ikaba, I've been doing a lot of pinhole lately and loving it. A very freeing process and also some amazing images. It really is. Pinhole always reminds me that you can make the, the tools as simply as possible. In the grand scheme of things, this is as much of a camera as this is. A camera in its most abstract form is a box that you control how much light gets in and out. The precision with which you can contort the camera and control the exposure, that's what's gonna increase your cost. And a pinhole is nothing more than a box with a very, very tiny hole in it. Whenever you shrink the size of the opening of your lens or pinhole, that's gonna force those rays of light to converge or look like they converge all at one point. Uh, when that happens, it gives you an increased perception of depth of field, but with a pinhole, you're gonna get diffraction, which means when you start squeezing things through a tiny opening, like squinting your eyes, everything's in focus and nothing's in focus at the same time. Very different from using a big, you know, coated, corrected lens, but the process is really the same. If you don't wanna carry around a giant thing and a whole bunch of tools and toys, pinhole is very, very liberating. All right. And don't worry, I haven't forgot that the giveaway is happening. You know, I'm gonna give it away right at five. That'll keep us like on track. So we're only a few minutes away. Scott, thanks for stopping by from Maine. Appreciate you. Rafa, thanks for stopping by. All right. How's everybody doing? Um, uh, Manuel asks, for, for my calotypes, or calotypes, have you tested different developers? I've read somewhere that you, the tonality can differ quite a bit. I haven't really strayed too far from the standard sodium citrate based developer for kale types. I know you can use, um, I know you can use some of the platinum, like you can overlap some developers from platinum palladium and some other processes, but I haven't really done so. If I want to affect tonality, I'll usually do that with the toning process. I like to use that lovely kind of purplish brown tone that you can get from a selenium toner. Um, but I haven't really strayed too far from that. But one thing you can do within the different developers is you can also control contrast by adding very, very minute amounts of potassium dichromate. Now, dichromates are nasty stuff, so be careful when you... Is it dichromate? I think it is dichromates. Now I'm second-guessing myself. It's orange. I'm pretty sure it's dichromate. All right. Hootsman from Brawny, Scotland. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate you. Hey, we got Jesse in the chat. Hey, how's it going, Jesse? Scott asks, do I use ventilation in the darkroom with my process? And to answer that question, I'm going to head into the darkroom. So we're going to head to the kind of boring look over to my tray. And I'm going to turn the fan on so you can hear it. So... And it's just kind of a boring view of my tray, but um, I'm getting closer to where the fan is. There is a giant exhaust fan. It's basically two box springs um, set up to uh, one of the main switches here, but it, it really sucks the air out. It's incredibly loud, so I leave it off during these live streams, but it is very, very important to have good ventilation whenever you are working in a darkroom space. When the DIY darkroom videos start to drop, that is going to be something I am a broken record about. Have good ventilation. I don't care how much space you're working in. If you're working in a, a mop closet or you're working in a giant commercial dark room, large spaces don't, might not need as much ventilation, especially if you have really high ceilings, but no matter what, you need to be able to pull the air out of the room consistently. That's the most important thing you can do. All right, let's see. See how everybody else is doing. Robert, thanks for stopping by. Oh, actually, Robert, um, BB, BBQ um, has a question about the effects of expired film. That's actually an episode that I've been trying to make happen for like over a year now. So before I do a full LFF or large format Friday on expired film, let's talk about it. 
This Ilford HP5 Plus that I have over here, this film is dated 2009. And because I used an aggressive amount of staining developer at a hotter temperature than normal, about 25 Celsius, and it's expired, what, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get expanded amounts of base fog. So as film expires, it's still getting hit with all sorts of background radiation just from existing. All films have an expiration date. The further you get from expiration, no matter how you treat it, it's going to get more base fog. If you store it in cool, you know, cool dry places and you keep it the same, it's gonna minimize that base fog, but you're always gonna get a little bit of fogging. There are some chemical ways you can treat that, and I don't wanna to go too deep into the weeds, you know, so I get you guys to subscribe and watch more videos. But yes, the older your film is, the higher that base fog is gonna get. This is where when you see those pictures for film that's like 80 or 100 years old, or 10 years old, but it was left in somebody's hot car for a few summers, that film is gonna have incredibly high base fog. Eventually that fog gets so much that it, always, it almost looks like you're trying to see a picture through the veil, because you are. There's a veil of fog happening on the film. By the way, I guess it's kind of assumed if you're on this channel, but I shouldn't assume. If you're like, what the heck is all of this stuff? We're talking about film photography, so using old-timey film. Yes, the plastic stuff you run through a camera that's got chemical coatings on it, and you can't see the picture until you take it to the darkroom and develop it. That's what's so cool about this process. There's all sorts of things that go deep with it, uh, but like my buddy Ben Horn says, this is its a mature process. It's been around for nearly 200 years. We kind of know what we're doing with it at this point. So. Uh, the neat thing about bringing new folks into film is it's rediscovering all these fun things. And because there's this many, you know, over a hundred years of development of this, you can kind of fine tune a part of the process that you find particularly interesting. All right. How are the questions doing? Oh, Mayfeld also added, um, expired film can get less light sensitive. And that has to do a lot with that extra base fog that forms on the film. So to compensate for that, you'll often hear folks tell you to, you know, overexpose that film more and more and more. Now with some films like um, transparency films or slide films, the ones that use the E6 process, those are just really hard to deal with. A lot of times you don't want to overexpose those because if you do that, you're going to get like blown out bits in there and you just have to kind of use it at that box speed and send it to a lab that you know and trust. All right. Uh, Rafa asks, have I shot with direct positive paper yet? I have worked a little bit with black and white direct positive. Um, in a few of my past videos, I featured my buddy, Mr. Steven Takis, that's T-A-K-A-C-S. He is an awesome photographer and he's done a giant body of work in a giant larger than life size brownie camera using the black and white reversal paper. Now I'll leave it up to Mr. Uh, Ethan Moses and Joe Van Cleve to do black and white uh, reversal with regular paper, but I've also kind of tapped into the RA4 color reversal process that those two have, uh, have also come up with. So it's really neat stuff. It's large effort, but it ends up being pretty cool. Um, in fact, it, stay tuned to the channel. If you're not subscribed yet, I'm also gonna have some stuff where I'm out and about with the 12 by 20 doing that very same thing. I've been planning having this camera for a very, very long time. And in the planning part of getting one of these cameras, when I bought my RA4 paper, I actually bought a 20 inch roll. So when the day came that I finally had one of these, I can easily cut off sheets of uh, paper for it. Oh, it's past five o'clock. My apologies at all, all. Thank you so much for hanging in there. We're gonna give away the, we're gonna give away the paint can camera. First, I'm gonna give a shout out to Steven Neff who just dropped in, uh, who just dropped in 10 bucks. Thank you so much, man. Steven says, thanks for the amazing channel. I have no real intention of ever shooting LF, but your content has made me think about optics and my photography in many new and different ways. Steven, thank you so much. Um, now that you bring up optics, I wanna talk about another crazy TikTok. I've actually started watching a ton of content from lately. There's this scientific optics company, I believe they're in upstate New York, called Edmund Optics. They low key have one of the most addicting TikTok accounts ever. They're always showing you how different optics bend light and they, they use like awesome lasers because they're a scientific optics company. They have, they sell 
custom lenses for like bending lasers and you know channeling out different wavelengths of light. I found out about them years ago because I bought some frosted opal glass from them for diffusing um, onto E6 film. Uh, we'll talk about that another day. But Edmund Optics, amazing company. They come out with this giant catalog every year of all the cool stuff that I could dr ever dream of using. And uh, I just love their stuff. So shameless plug for them. All right. How's everybody doing? Mark, thanks for stopping by. Rick, thank you so much. All right, so let's, uh, let's do this giveaway. I'm really not sure how we're going to manage it, but what I think I'm gonna have to ask everybody to do is to, oh boy. Um, hey, Lore, can you help me out with this one? Sorry. I didn't really have like a great, uh, a great way in mind on how to do this giveaway, but I, I, I do wanna give away something if we hit this number and we're here, we've beaten it. This is the largest like tune in we've ever had. So uh, let's, let's see if we can give away this camera. So what I want everybody to do in the chat right now to make it easy for Lore to find, uh, to find your name. If you want in on the pinhole paint can, go ahead and just type in pinhole. Nothing, nothing else, just type in pinhole to chat and we're gonna build a list off of that. And then at, you know, we're gonna, we'll draw your name. And once we've got your name, we'll have you, we'll have you send over and we'll arrange getting this paint hole pin, uh, pinhole paint can camera to you. All right, there are so many people here. Laura, I, I love you very much, Laura. Thank you for <laughs> managing some of this stuff. All right, here it comes. Uh, if you're just joining us and you see the chat lighting up with pinhole, that's because you're here at Large Format Live. I'm rewarding folks that stopped by today with a pinhole camera. Uh, don't worry, I'm also going to be, for folks that are watching this on the pre-recording, I'm also, once all of this is over with, I'm going to have a link for a different giveaway camera, which I'm also going to do. Laura doesn't have to manage this one, but Whoops, there it is. I happen to own two of these crazy, fantastical Bob Gratian cameras. And this one is the eight by 10 pinhole. Now this one's nice cause it's got like a little wood veneering on it. And it's, it's very, very nice. Um, I've heard from some pinhole folks that it's not like as sharp as some could be, but you know, for handmade, it looks pretty good. And the contact prints look great from it. So if you're not watching, if you're watching this later on, um, after this airs, I'm gonna have uh, the mirage.com slash, I think it's LFF giveaway or giveaways. Uh, that's gonna be updated with information for the pinhole camera. I'm gonna be opening up this giveaway. I'm probably gonna give it a month just so everybody has time to watch through and enter if they want. This is a worldwide asterisk giveaway. There are some locations, unfortunately, I can't send to. Um, and, ooh, and there'll be details on the website for that. So if you're eligible, I would love to send that to you. All right, Carrie, I'm pinning that message. <laughs> Oh man. Hey, I see JP in the chat. JP, thanks for, uh, thanks for stopping by. I'm seeing all sorts of very familiar names here. Oh, wet dog, dry fly photography. That's a fantastic name. There's Steven. Hey, Andon, thanks for stopping by. We'll see you tomorrow for, uh, for the black and white workshop. Are you excited, man? This is gonna be cool. All right. Oh my gosh, look at all these folks in here. Very, very cool. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Roger says, please not me. I already have a paint can and a pin. Very, very cute. All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. How did I miss this? Tariq. Thank you so much for stopping by, sir. Uh, everybody, did you know Tariq has a YouTube channel? Head over there, give him a sub. He's, he's got just low key, low, very chill vibes uh, type videos that are behind the scenes stuff. 
Um, I am going to be getting in, back into the studio with him because, let's face it, he's a super popular good dude and has a lot of great insight when it comes to all things in the studio and working with people. I become a better portrait shooter the second I'm around him. And then as soon as he leaves, I magically forget all of it. So if you want to see more content with Tariq, be sure to get subscribed. And uh, you're going to see some stuff here in season five of LFF with Tariq. Perfect. Let's see how we got. Um, oh, Vladimir asks, this is a little bit ways back. But Vladimir asks, uh, have I tried cyanotype printing with ULF? I have. Um, the first prints I did were with negatives that were really super foggy and not very good. So the prints turned out very poorly, unfortunately, but I have tried cyanotype. Cyanotype is one of those processes, just like the calotypes, where you need to have a lot of density in the negative, a lot of contrast to make it work. And that's the interesting thing. An expired negative can have a lot of density, but it can have, but it usually has very low contrast because everything is foggy. When you use a fresh film or an aggressive amount of development, you can expand that contrast and still have a clear base with a high density, giving you a higher contrast. All right, let's see how we're doing. Laura's gonna kill me. I'm gonna have to, I, I think I'm gonna have to buy her a cheesecake or something. This is, this is crazy. Um, Oh, uh, Laura asks, how can people enter after uh, the video is done? So uh, it's kind of be kind of like two concurrent giveaways. I'm actually going to find the links for the giveaway. Uh, it's LFF uh, giveaway. I haven't even updated the website, guys, because, uh, yeah, I was busy building today's live stream. Uh, I'm actually going to pin this comment. All right. So that is for uh, this larger 8x10 pinhole camera. Um, you know, another reason I wanted to do this giveaway so soon after the other camera was um, in the last giveaway for the, the Graflex camera, many of you left like short reports, like, <laughs> like English reports on, you know, how much you enjoy large format or what you plan to do with the camera. And I was like really, I was really moved by a lot of the awesome projects that folks had on their mind that they wanted to do with large format. And I wanna enable more folks into large format. That's the whole reason this channel exists. It's thanks to you and I'm just gonna try to give back to you as much as possible. So that's why I'm giving away the paint can right now and I'm gonna give the eight by 10 away later. If you win one camera, you are not eligible to win the other, unfortunately. So if you're here right now and you win the paint can, unfortunately, you're not gonna be eligible for the, uh, the eight by 10, but good luck. All right, how are we doing here? <laughs> Trucker says buy her too, She's, she is worth it. All right, yes, everybody uh, give Laura a big round of applause for managing all of this stuff. All right. Oh, Rafe, um, yeah, I would love to have you for a one-on-one -on -one session. By the way, uh, if you head over to my main website, mirage.com, uh, you can, if you want to get together like this, but just kind of a closed <laughs> live stream type thing, and you want to learn a particular thing about large format or ask any, you know, burning questions, that's a great way to do so. So you can go to mirage.com slash one-on-one and uh, learn more. Very cool. All right, let's see how we're doing here in the comments. Yes, Lord, the paint can is going to be resolved before the end of the uh, end of the stream. All right. All right. Cool, Mayfell. Thanks for stopping by. All right, everyone. Yes, give uh, give Lore all the love. She is she's like the backbone of all of this stuff. If Laura didn't have so much experience in uh, watching content from other streamers on popular platforms like YouTube, Twitch, uh, and, uh, and Discord, uh, this wouldn't be able to happen in the same way it does. By the way, if you're just joining us, you're one of the 133 people watching. Thank you so much. It's Large Format Friday, and we're Large Format Live here from uh, the darkroom space up at 400 West Rich in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this is where I occasionally work and teach out of. But in the summer, I'm usually not here because it's really hot. Uh, it's, it's getting hotter because I turned some of the ventilation off so I can talk. But uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh oh, I think my other camera, yeah, my other camera died. So I gotta go get some, uh, get some battery action in that. 
Uh-oh. Uh, do I have the other battery? I think I do. Yeah. I knew that was going to happen, and I still let it happen. Goodness gracious me. Will it turn back on? Oh, I think it just... I think it just went to a low power state. Man, I hope that's what it was. How's everybody doing? All right. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, so again, if you're just joining us, it's large format live. We're doing questions and answers. If you see people typing pinhole, uh, jump in, type in pinhole for your chance to win the paint can pinhole. It's a fun little camera. It's the most relieving thing ever. And it even has a nice little tripod socket on the bottom so you can do those long pinhole exposures. Works well for paper and it's light tight enough to use a low speed film like ortho film 25 ISO or lower is perfect. All right. Oh, no, the camera did go out again. I wonder, huh? Oh, I'm gonna use my battery backup. I think I have that with me. Uh, yes, I do. It's somewhere. Normally this is where I would use like a, a funny little graphic, like, hey, we're having technical difficulties, but there's always technical difficulties when you do a live stream. It is unavoidable. Um, that's the cord I want. All right, I gotta plug this in. By the way, you know, a lot of folks ask me, or maybe they even just, some folks even think that I'm like a purist because I, I use like these old timey cameras, but the truth is, without having the backbone of digital photography and digital cinematography with these mirrorless and DSLR cameras, I wouldn't be able to do the channel the same way I do it. So I'm quite the opposite of a purist. I learned in a hybrid medium. I think part of being a millennial is just being like a bridge to many things, a bridge to, from the, you know, from kids that lived outside after school uh, to kids that sit behind computers all day, the analog and the digital bridge. So it just comes very naturally to, yeah, work in kind of both of these worlds. All right, enough ranting and sounding like, sounding like a super, super old guy reminiscent about photography. I'm gonna put my battery here. Just replacing the battery. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Leave the camera off and let it get a little trickly charge. Okay, thanks everybody for uh, hanging in there with me while the technical, uh, technical stuff was going on. How is everybody doing? Let's see, oh, Max Shoots Film asked glass plate. Um, I'm not 100% sure on glass plate yet, but in the next few weeks, I'm gonna have the opportunity to work with my good buddy, Mr. Steven Takis. He's my darkroom roomie up here at 400 West Rich, and he is doing a dry plate tintype workshop uh, down in North Carolina. And I'm gonna be his assistant for, uh, for a week, week and a half. And there will be some channel content that I hope to make from that, even if it's just a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. But uh, I'm gonna bring you my experiences working with dry plate and hopefully a little bit more you know, into that process. Plates are a lot of fun, but I have to like keep myself distanced from it because I can't have another, just ask Laura. I can't have another thing going on. I can barely manage all the things I want to do right now. So plates are, they're on the back burner, but the cool thing about plates, both dry plates, glass plates, wet plates, we're always gonna be able to do those because it's a hand coated process. Unless like silver goes away, we're gonna be able to do those for a very long time, just you know, regardless of the state of other forms of film photography. So right now my, my method for this is I wanna get a lot of color in, I wanna get a lot of modern, you know, still made stuff in while I can. Uh, I don't have any sort of assumption this is gonna last forever, but the older techniques, they're gonna be around a while. Matt can stop using new film anytime he wants. Uh, I try to tell myself that, but then I look at the film fridge and it tells me otherwise. All right. Um, da, ba, ba, ba. Hootsman uh, says, I've learned so much shooting with 5x7 and half plate cameras since following you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't actually ever show um, anything half plate or 5x7, so I'm really glad you could find some use out of, yeah, the whole channel here. 
Um, by the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, this is, you know, every other week we're going to be here and talking about something large format. Now, it's not always going to be live. In fact, this will probably only happen four to five times a year. Really, it's like a special occasion. But I like to keep folks up to date and offer fun little live rewards like the pinhole paint hole, uh, pin, <laughs> paint hole, <laughs> uh, the pinhole paint can camera. Jeez, that is a tongue twister. Anyway, I like to offer those little incentives every once in a while. It's fun to do, and there's really good energy at these live streams, so I really appreciate y'all. All right. Let's see, how is everybody doing here in the chat? Oh, Gordon says uh, zebra plates are now in version two. I, I think I saw a post about that, but I didn't know it was like a new version of the plates. So that's awesome. I, I have not tried zebra plates yet. Uh, I am gonna be having the opportunity to try out uh, J Lane dry plates here, here within the year. I, I'm trying to space this out reasonably. I never want to like promise something right away unless I'm already working on it because there's there's so many things in the pipeline. I, my biggest worry when I started this little when I re rebooted this channel like two years ago was I thought oh man I just don't know if I have enough to talk about. Like it's so easy to cover large format. It's it's never gonna end. <laughs> It'll end when like. I'm completely burned out because there's, yeah, there's never, there's never some, there's never an, a topic uh, that doesn't need like more in depth or we can go further with it. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep this going as long as, uh, long as I want to. Um, let's see. Orlando says, any way to make a large DIY print developing tank? You know, I have not tried it. I think one of the larger limitations, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I know there's some 3D printers in the chat, but a lot of the materials that we use for 3D printing, they're not, they're not porous, but they're not great at retaining uh, liquid either, and a lot of them aren't going to have the kind of resistance necessary. So a lot of the um, materials that you'll see for like commercially made uh, tanks are either a specific kind of plastic or something that's coated so they're not going to like soak up a lot of those developing chemicals and they're just going to be made to like a very specific tolerance uh, so they're usually like molded or i don't know if i don't even know if any of them are like laser cut but i haven't seen any 3d printed ones there are 3d printed accessories for these tanks but not the tanks themselves all right uh Marriott Asks, uh, says, I would love to see my DIY solutions for developing x-ray without scratches. There are some very clever DIY uh, solutions for that. Uh, probably the easiest one that I did very early on. It's great for one or two sheets at a time. It's using one and two gallon freezer bags. So like those double zipper Ziploc or, you know, reclosable bags. Those are great. You fill them with liquid and you just push it around to agitate the film. That can actually develop your film very, very well. All right, uh, Gordon says plastic sewer pipe. That's another one. Basically you can make little log roller tanks. So there are these uh, commercially made tubes. I, they might even still be made new called BTZS or beyond the zone system tubes. They had caps in them that would hold liquid, but yeah, you can do the same thing with capped over PVC pipe. Probably like the big stuff, like three or four inch pipe will be good. I think, yeah, maybe even five, but that'll be good for eight by 10 sheets. All right. All right, I knew, see, I knew Devin would come in with the answer. So this is in regards to 3D printed tanks. Um, it's really dependent on layer bonding and not a good application for it. I thought so because the way 3D printers deposit material is they are putting it on layer by layer. And the only way to get things smooth is to like sand it or like seal it with another, you know, with another additive. And that can create gaps in the surface and you don't want a leaky tank. The whole idea of a tank is that the stuff is not oozing out of it. Oh, Rafa, I don't, I'm, I'm wondering how it let you book that session that should have uh, had me booked for that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk, uh, we, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you scheduled and taken care of. Even if I have to like push it back like an hour or something, we'll, we'll get you there. All right. Um, uh, Nico says, when do I start touring the US? I start touring the US when um, I finally had time to take a small vacation with Lore. Um, it's, I've already been kind of on the road for other stuff and, uh, 
I owe her as much time off as I owe myself. So I'm um, not gonna be doing a lot of stuff probably in like the fall into winter. That's gonna be kind of a slow season, gonna be doing a lot of printing and pre-recorded stuff. But if a tour of, so of sorts will happen, it's probably gonna be in like well into 2023, unfortunately. All right. Cool. All right. Laura says we got 67 names in the list. Um, I, we're going to, we're going to call it now. It's 525. Uh, you've got five minutes. So if you want in on the pinhole paint can, go ahead and type pinhole and only pinhole into the chat. Laura will get you added on there and we'll do the drawing at 530. And while we're waiting on that, I'm going to switch over to the other. Oh, we got some loud voices. Um, I'm going to switch over to the other camera and I'm going to show you, um, laying the negative onto the paper, put it in the frame, and then we're gonna, we're gonna do an exposure on it. All right. So if this is your first time joining us, this insanity is known as large format live. Is this going? Okay, hopefully my camera stays going for a while here. Um, my, is this, is this dry? Oh yeah, this is plenty dry. So you can see my, uh, there's my paper. It's nice and dry. There's no puddles or anything. That's exactly what I want. I'm going to grab the negative that we're going to be exposing with today. How's that feed look? Is that coming through? Okay, good. That's coming through. Um, my negative probably is not going to fit because my coating, I didn't pencil it out beforehand. How are we doing? Ooh, that is, that is uh, going to be tight, but you know what? It's just going to cover, so we're going we're gonna to call that good. I'm going to pull this over to my contact printing frame. Don't worry, I'm going to show everybody on stream what that looks like before this goes into the UV light source. But what I'm doing is I'm preparing my negative by laying it in contact with the now dried, coated paper. And when I expose this to ultraviolet light, uh, this particular print for about for about eight minutes, that's gonna give me enough to show you what I shot. I think that's where I want it. Hopefully that is a good placement. Sorry for the boring shot. I promise I'll get back and start to answer those questions once we get exposing. All right, how's this look? How's that lineup looking? You know what? That does not look bad. I'm going to show everybody what this looks like real quick. And then we'll get her in this. We'll get her in the exposure unit. I got a couple dusties on the frame, but I can't worry about that right now. Okay. So real quick, I've got a big giant frame. Oh, is it going? Okay, good. Got my big giant frame right here. And uh, yeah, we're going to drop this into the UV exposure unit. Whoops. Hit my camera. I don't want to hit that too hard. Oh, don't want to hit that too hard. How's this doing? There we go. All right. And oh, I need to set a timer for eight minutes. Let's see. It is 528. Actually, okay, cool. I know when to pull it. All right, we're gonna expose for eight minutes. Okay, sweet. Let's see if we can catch up to where everything's at. Uh, by the way, you have two minutes if you want to enter for the pin paint can pinhole camera. Type pinhole into the chat. Laura will get you added in there. Whew. All right. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in for this large format Friday, for this large format live. I'm doing way too many things at once, but that's, that's my MO. So here we are. We're printing, we're chatting, we're giving away a camera, we're trying to spread as much large format and film photography love worldwide as possible. So thank you so much. All right. Uh, I see Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Focal Plane, thanks for stopping by. Okay, Laura says no repeats, please. Uh, let's see. Uh, Max, 
So very, uh, Max Shoots Film asked, uh, could I do a, a video on tray processing? I actually have two videos on the channel on tray processing. One of them though, I wouldn't recommend because it's ancient. It was shot with like the original Droid phone. So that one's terrible. But I think one of the early episodes of Large Format Friday talks about ways to process film. And I do a quick demonstration of how I like to do sheet film processing. For more specifics on sheet film processing, I don't have a like a solo video. Uh, but I will recommend checking out Ansel Adams' The Negative, where he outlines uh, how he does it, and it's, it's a great tutorial. I think there's an old Ed Weston video. So Edward Weston, uh, one of the F64 greats, known for the peppers and all sorts of cool contact prints. He has one of his old documentary videos, which kind of shows some of that process as well. It's great stuff. All right, how are folks doing? Roger, thanks for stopping by. Have a great night. Uh, actually, all my all my viewers over in over in Europe, thank you for stopping by. And uh, yeah, I know it's late over there. This is kind of a late live stream, but I wanted to do LFF and large format live at the same time. So here we are. All right. Yes, this is definitely a by the seat of your pants uh, type thing. That's the cool thing about live streams. They always kind of end up like that, but. They're more genuine that way too. I, I never want to pretend that this is like a super polished thing. There's a lot of prep that goes into it, but so many things can go wrong. And there are so many times, so many times where I just want to blurt out obscenities. And I, I don't think I have on stream yet. So we'll, we'll keep that record going. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Taco Ramon uh, says, I'm having one heck of a time trying to figure out X-ray film and HC 110, any pointers? Also, I got Camera Dactyl's new LF back. Any filters, for, any suggestions for color reversal? Okay, Taco. So the one thing I'd recommend, I have an RA, I have a whole series on RA4 reversal on the channel. So get subscribed. Head back through seasons three and four. I have some update videos on. So if you just type RA-4 in the channel, you'll find all my videos where I mention it. The latest one I have, I think from December or November of last year, is like 21 minutes. It talks about everything down to the filter pack, how to test and everything that goes into it. So definitely watch that a few times, keep it bookmarked. Um, for x-ray film, I also have an episode on x-ray film that was back from season one. And if you type x-ray film, you'll also see some of my very old videos from like 12 years ago. Those are terrible, but there's some, there's still some good information in there and links to older blog posts about it. But basically when you're doing something like HC 110, oh, how's my, okay. Whew. My exposure is doing well. Okay, I just want to make sure. I was like, wait, my exposure unit, uh, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, HC 110, you want to use a very aggressive, like a very high dilution. So you want to have a very small amount of HC 110 and a lot of water. Typically you want a very dilute developer and this will help you kind of elongate the length of time that, that developing occurs. And you just want to, yeah, you want to dilute it as much as possible. Keep it as cold as you can, like not like too cold, but like close to 20 Celsius if possible. And you want to have a water bath nearby. So you can, when you watch it, so you can develop this by inspection, you can make sure that that density we talked about earlier isn't going to be forming too quickly. That's the biggest culprit with x-ray film is there's usually, if it's double-sided, you're going to have emulsion on two different sides and that's going to intensify your contrast. All right, uh, Max shoots film. I'd love an R-rated LFF. There was that. Uh, there was the cringe video from last uh, from last year. That that was probably the closest I'll get. But there's definitely lots of blooper reels with lots of swear words. There's probably about five straight minutes of that. <laughs> All right, Calvin from New Zealand. It's 9:30 in the morning. Well, I guess this is your Saturday morning cartoons. <laughs> Uh, definitely not as cool as cartoons, but I appreciate you stopping by. All right. Brian, thanks for stopping by. Well, happy Large Format Friday. Good seeing you. All right. Uh, Frank says, uh, my friends and I have been shooting Agfa radio mat and cutting it down from the 8x10 sheets to whatever format necessary. Are there other x-ray films that you would recommend? Uh, if you want something that's already cut down to size, there is the FPP x-ray film that's an industrial very low iso um, blue sensitive x-ray film that stuff is great any of the fuji film stuff is good uh, i think fuji is probably like going to be the most consistent stuff there's also cxs online where they will sell old kodak agfa 
Fuji, whatever they've got on hand. CareStream, I think, is another one. A lot, they're all gonna be very similar. X-ray film, because it's so cheap and because it's meant to be like viewed once or twice and then essentially discarded, it's not gonna have the same archival properties, protective layers, all the modern stuff we like out of Kodak and Ilford and Fuji. So just keep that in mind. But use whatever you like. I would recommend looking for green sensitive or what's called full speed green. That's gonna be the good stuff when it comes to x-ray film. All right. Cool, all right, Laura. Let me get, oh, everyone's like, watch the printer. Yes, I've got, a, I've got one minute and 20 seconds. So we're, we're, we'll do the giveaway winner. I'll give some congratulations. So random, all right, I'm gonna do the random number generator to do the drawing. Lore, again, thank you so much. One to 79. All right, drum roll. We're gonna do the giveaway. So, all right. Lore, our winner is number 68. That was the number we drew, number 68. So if you could tell us who number 68 is, please. All right. When is Sub Miniature Saturday? You know, that's, that's not as improbable as you think. I'm just gonna leave it at that. I, I love dropping Easter eggs, but that's, that's as much as you're gonna get out of me. All right, we're less than 30 seconds, but Laura, we're looking for number 68. Entry number 68 is the winner of the paint hole, paint, the paint can pinhole. Pe -pe -pe -pe. Okay. All right, I've got 10 seconds left on the prints. Uh, Brian asks, can you make x-ray archival by proper washing? You can fix it and do all the right washing. It just doesn't have protective layers. So you want to get it into a sleeve as soon as possible. And that's the best we can do. It's probably still going to last a long time, but not the same level as modern films. Okay. There's like, there's like a wedding going on out behind me. So if you hear like piano and singing, that's what it is. I stopped my prints. Okay. Uh, number 68, John Verna, congratulations. The Bob Gratian pinhole paint can is all yours. So please email me largeformatquestions at gmail.com and we'll, uh, we'll coordinate and we'll arrange for shipping of this. It's probably not gonna be too crazy shipping. It's, it's just a big empty paint can. So congratulations everybody. Thank you for entering and stopping by and hopefully you'll still hang in there. Don't go away yet. I've got a few more details to share with, uh, with everybody. Of course, in addition to that, we have the Bob Gratian uh, 8x10 pinhole camera. This is going to be given away. I'm gonna be running this contest for an additional month to make sure everybody has time. So even if you missed the live, you're gonna be able to enter for the chance to win one of these. Not all countries are gonna be eligible for shipment, but this is still, I'm gonna consider it a worldwide giveaway that, you know, that makes it like as fair uh, as, as I can. I can't ship it to, unfortunately, I can't ship anything to Russia or Ukraine right now. And I think like Iraq and Iran, unfortunately, I can't ship to. And there's a few African countries I can't. Sadly, it's just because I'm using the U.S. Postal Service. It keeps costs kind of manageable. And it's so you don't get hit with like duties and taxes. Anyway, here's the print. My kale type has been exposed and it looks kind of brown, but that's good. That means I've got something. Whoa, I just saw a big donation come in. Uh, Hootsman, th thank you so much. You definitely, uh, that's wild. You didn't have to do that. This is, uh, thank you. Uh, well, at least the paint can will get, uh, will get shipped out uh, expeditiously now, so thank you. Um, all right, let's, all right, I'm, Laura, I'm pinning this comment because that's, that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Um, Let's, yeah, let's take a look at the finished prints. I, I'm gonna get this into the dark room, switching over to the cam. Hootsman, again, this, that's wild. Thank you so much. Um, you know, with everything going on in the world right now and all the negative news, it's really easy to get like, I don't know, bummed out and just generally lose faith in a lot of things in the world. And um, it always takes acts like this from other folks you haven't met in real life to uh, restore that faith. So thank you so much for everybody who's tuning in and providing positive vibes. Um, here's, 
Here's what the print looks like before it gets developed. Uh, if I leave that like that, it's gonna get, I don't want it to get ruined, but I also want this, the show to go on. So um, that's the print. I gotta clean up some stuff underneath the print. And I kind of have to like race against the clock. I don't want, you know, the door behind me is open and there's stuff going on behind me. So I don't want that to like completely ruin uh, the print and like fog it and stuff. But I also want there to be, you know, some drum rolls, some drum. I don't know if you can see kind of the faint stuff here. There's like this outline, these lines. That's a bridge in the background. And now that I'm looking at it, I, I'm running pretty low on developer. Hopefully this will, hopefully this will do something. Hopefully it will look good. I don't have a lot of developer in there, but I think I have enough to cover. Ooh, just barely. Okay. Actually, I'm gonna raise this up a little bit. Sorry for the shake. Ooh, yeah, really sorry for the shake. Okay, now we can see a little bit more of it. All right, um, everybody, we're about to develop out the... Actually, you know what? I'm going to funnel this back into my developer bottle. This is an old used bottle of FPP Super Mono Bath that I have turned into a... Uh, no, I'll pour it into the thing. So I'm pouring it into here so I can glug it out. <laughs> Uh, very very easily onto the print because when it's when I have a very small amount in the tray it's not going to it's not going to flow the way I want it to so sorry for the camera work I can only do one pour and one other thing at the same time How we... okay we're pouring our developer this is some sodium sodium citrate and water I can't remember the dilution off the top of my head I want to say 20% Gosh, that's a very small amount of developer. Hopefully that's enough. It should be. By the way, the only thing we're gonna be able to show on stream today is the development. Oh, there's just so much going on. Laura, thank you so much for handling the giveaway. Oh my God, that's actually larger than the tray. Okay. So many things, so little time. Okay. Prints in the tray. It's been exposed for about eight minutes under my DIY UV exposure units. Big old negative, 12 by 20 on a sheet of Hanamula Platinum rag. Let's go. Ready, one, two, three. Okay. All right, so this print, this photograph was made um, in Sault Ste. Marie which is in the upper peninsula, just barely into the upper peninsula. And uh, this is the bridge that leads to Canada. Uh, this was taken uh, shortly after photo stock. So when I was up in the upper peninsula for photo stock, my buddy Stephen Takis and I stopped in Sault Ste. Marie to just check out the joint. We went to Mackinac Island, loaded up on fudge and other treats. And I wanted to force myself to make some photographs with the 12 by 20. And when we were up in Sault Ste. Marie, I tried to do like this urban architecture kind of stuff. I wanted to make a picture with the bridge. But while we were up there, um, we, we, heard, uh, we heard some laughter. And these, these three gentlemen were playing with these like the styrofoam planes that you can like just throw into the wind. And it was getting like really, really windy. And I wasn't really comfortable with, you know, holding the, not holding the camera, but steadying the camera for long exposures and uh, they were cool with us taking their photographs. So uh, you can kind of see here, there's one of the styrofoam planes here, and there they are just throwing around uh, their planes. And I, I photographed them. This doesn't, this looks a lot wider than it is. This was with my longest lens for the 12 by 20, which is a 480 millimeter lens. And yeah, I can already tell you this developer, because it looks like cloudy and kind of yellow, um, this developer is toast. I'm actually going to throw it out when I'm done. It doesn't have any more of the good stuff. What I'm really surprised about is this negative is really hard to photograph on a light table, but that's the beauty of working with in-camera negatives. When you know your film, you know your processing time and how much you need to produce that, that density, this is exactly what I was imagining when I took the photograph. I've got everybody, every value where it needs to be, and I even have separation in these like late afternoon clouds. 
Now, this looks a little bit flatter than maybe a silver gelatin print might, and that's because this is a print on a cotton rag piece of paper. If you're displaying one of these, you want to hit it with a little bit more light than normal. But man, I am, I am so happy with how this looks. You know, I can get nitpicky and say I want like a little bit more dodge here and maybe a little bit more burn in other areas, but this is, this is what I wanted out of the shot. So I'm, I'm really happy with this. My shutter speed was as fast as I was comfortable with in overcast light with 400 speed film at F9, which is, what is that? I think it was a 60th of a second for the shot. There's a little bit of flutteriness with the, with the planes, but yeah, it's all there and they're sharp. Oh man. I don't know if I can, let me see if I can zoom it in. I apologize if it's too shaky. Let's see if I can show how sharp this is. Yeah. Oh man. I love large format. That's uh, yeah, that's what low key why I do this channel. I want to show everyone that large format isn't this crazy intimidating thing. You can do it and I want to give you the tools to do it. They might be expensive. They might be time consuming but at least you got someone to show you how to do it. If you're just stopping by now, this is an, a 12 by 20 kalotype print, which is an alternative photographic process, meaning it doesn't use silver gelatin. It does have an emulsion, but it's not in gelatin. It's, uh, it's using some metal salts, including silver nitrate and some ferric oxalate, so an iron, uh, an iron salt. I'm going to take this out of the developer and move it to the wash, and then we're going to wrap up the show. Oh man, I am so happy with how this looks. I might take the tray out into the big light so you guys can get a, a better look. Oh, this is great. All right, I'm going to get that rinsing a little bit. I'm just going to fill this up with water. Thanks everybody for hanging in there. We'll wrap up the show. I'll try not to fry out any of my electronics. Ooh, all right. I have to keep the gloves on for now. All right. All right, how are we all doing? Hey, we still have some folks hanging out. Welcome back, back to the main camera. How are folks doing? All right. Ooh. Got some catching up to do. How, how are we doing here? Very cool. All right. Hey, everybody, if you've already, uh, if you're on your way out or about to, thank you so much for stopping by. We're kind of closing out the show now. Uh, we made the prints. We did the giveaway. We did all the stuff. I actually accomplished everything. This is, this might be the first time, but thank you so much for stopping by today. If you have any questions about the large format photographic process, you can always feel free to drop those down below in the comments, even though it's a live thing. I do read the comments afterward, but for those larger questions, you can feel free to hit me up at largeformatquestions at gmail.com. All right, I'll say my final goodbyes, answer some other questions. Cool, 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 cool. Thank you everybody for the compliments on the prints. I appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by. Very cool. All right. Oh, thank you all for the kind words. This is great. Whew. All right. Well, yeah, I think we're just gonna, I think we're gonna call it. Um, everybody, thanks for hanging out. You know what? Uh, even though it's gonna make a mess, I'm gonna bring that print out. It, I think it's gonna look even cooler in the light. Now it's kind of in the process of like fading. Whoa, that's a lot more water than I thought. Oh, well, it's kind of in the process of fading underneath here. I'm like catching it with my foot. Uh, but yeah, this is what our calotype looks like. It's gonna get a little bit darker as I wash it and tone it. I'm excited about it. Large format is alive and well, at least here on the channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, 
Every other Friday, we're gonna be here talking about something large format and coming soon, some extra content to the channel uh, regarding DIY darkroom, uh, medium format film, and beyond. If it's film photography, you're gonna find it here on the Matt Mirage channel. So uh, last time, thank you so much, everybody, for stopping by. Thanks for checking out the print process, all your great questions. Good luck. Be sure to enter the giveaway. I'm going to have a link in the description to the other giveaway for the Bob Gratian 8x10 pinhole camera. Uh, congrats to the winner of the paint can pinhole. Email me so I can get your information and get that camera out to you. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you in a couple more weeks for more Large Format Friday. We'll see you then.